afternoon. Welcome to our uh, Friday afternoon information security colloquium. We're very privileged today to have Dr. Gene Spafford from Purdue University. He's a professor in, I think, three departments at Purdue, right? Or four departments at Purdue. He is a um, the director of the Sirius, which is the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security at Purdue. He is also a member of the President's Information Te uh, Technology Advisory Committee. And this year he is serving as um, part-time NSF Senior Advisor on Cybersecurity to the Assistant Director size and is also Chair of the U.S. Um, ACM Public Policy Committee. So he has a very um, illustrious uh, background and he's, we're very lucky to have um, someone with such depth and breadth of the background in security and so many years of experience speaking with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Usually, uh, that's the kind of introduction when, rather than saying uh, one of one of the old timers in security, it's somebody with lots of experience. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, my talk today is not so much directed at my own research, although it is definitely part of this talk, but is also to present to you some of the things I've been doing at NSF that we're concerned with with uh, the PTAC and uh, results of the CRA Grand Challenges conference that occurred at the end of last year. All of these things together relate to the same set of themes, and those are the ones that I'm going to be presenting to you here. The intent of this talk is to give you an idea of some of the things that we believe, we being some number of people in the field, to be some of the uh, long-term problems that we face, some of the research arenas that we've been exploring that may not be the best place to devote our energy, and to give you some view of some grand challenges that potentially hold research interest and great payoff to investigate, perhaps inspire some of you to start thinking along these lines for research projects. So with that said, let me uh, briefly say something about the Computing Research Association. The Computing Research Association uh, is a large nonprofit organization. It is composed of representatives from the 200 plus PhD granting um, departments of computer science and computer engineering in North America, uh, primarily computer science departments, and uh, NC State's computer science department is a member of the CRA. It also has representatives from most of the major industrial research labs in computing and from the six major computing associations uh, that are operative in North America, including ACM, IEEE, and USENIX. The mission of the Computing Research Association is to support and strengthen uh, interest in computing research in all its various forms and to help ensure that resources and attention are focused needs in computing research. Uh, second of all, to increase the opportunities and the participation of women and minorities in computing. Um, this is an area where we're certainly not taking full advantage of all of the potential that we have uh, in the population to study and contribute in this area. And third, uh, improve the understanding of public uh, and policy makers about the issues facing us in computing. What are some of the difficulties? What are some of the opportunities? Uh, what are some of the things that will really help make computing more effective in our society? So with those as missions, um, you'll see shortly here why the grand challenges fit within that. I'll start by saying a few things about the state of cybersecurity, and I don't really want to go through a long uh, litany of things that have appeared in the news or that you may know about otherwise. It's really hard to avoid some of the information about the state of cybersecurity currently uh, as practiced. Uh, for example, last year there were over 4,000 security critical flaws reported and patches issued for commodity software. Now, that doesn't include all the patches, so certainly the software that's out there is considerably a uh, larger number of faults. It's buggier than simply the 4,000. But these are 4,000 faults that were considered to be severe enough to have some form of 
interim patch released and need to be applied. This is against products by all different vendors, uh, including uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple, Oracle, uh, Linux systems, and a number of others. This means that your average system administrator in a mixed venue shop probably had to apply on the order of 30 to 40 patches per week to keep up. And this is a, an incredible workload. That workload has driven a lot of concern in funding in government as to where the dollars go for cybersecurity research and development. What's interesting also to note here, and I know that several of you have looked at the issues of software design, of those 4,000 flaws as analyzed, about three quarters of them are simple design failures, primarily argument validation problems. So these are not deeply subtle, difficult kinds of flaws to find, prevent, or exploit. These are the kinds of flaws that in the introductory uh, programming classes, we normally teach how to avoid them, like checking your input to make sure it matches what you expect and looking for buffer overflow. Also, as of the end of the year, we've now crossed the threshold for over 100,000 known viruses and worm programs in the whole area of malicious software. Not all of these are currently active, but over 100,000 are now known to the community and threaten the software that we use. Symantec Corporation reports that they are receiving over 200 new ones per week being so, uh, reported to their various offices that they then have to analyze and develop counter signatures for in their products. 200 per week, easy to work that out. You're looking at on the order of 25 to 30 new viruses per day. How often do you update the signatures in your antivirus software? And the numbers are getting worse. The lot number of large scale attacks where automated attacks using tools, attacking large numbers of systems in, in uh, environments uh, such as uh, universities, businesses, government agencies are doubling approximately every year and they're becoming faster and more sophisticated. We're now worried about large-scale attacks that may uh, sweep through the entire internet in a matter of under 15 minutes, taking down hundreds of thousands of machines in a very short amount of time. It's also the case that the damages being caused by these various kinds of attacks are increasing at a substantial rate, but are largely hidden. They're hidden in that most companies don't report them when they're single instances. And they're hidden in that the damages caused are not easily calculated as to dollar cost and therefore there's no central reporting, there's no really good value to be able to uh, uh, point to and say this is the current yearly load from security incidents. But we do have some reasonable estimates based on projections from large scale numbers. Uh, one number for instance from the Semantic Corporation is that viruses, worms, and similar malicious software are causing on the order of $55 billion a year worldwide in downtime lost files uh, and corrupted data. That is up from $25 billion uh, the year before in 2002 and up from $10 billion the year before. So again, it's better than doubling in those cases. Spam is currently occupying more than 60% of all the email bandwidth going through many commercial providers. It now outweighs all the legitimate mail that you may otherwise be getting. That has a hidden cost in the downtime spent to process it and the amount of time that employees, readers, students have to spend reading the mail to decide whether it's something to discard or not. Uh, it uses up disk space, it uses up bandwidth, and of course it occupies a lot of time configuring and running anti-spam programs that may or may not work well. Uh, reports, surveys done on large companies and government agencies indicate that all have suffered some kind of security incident, break-in, or fraud in the last year. Every single business and enterprise survey reports this, without exceptions. Now, not all respond to those requests, but we can extrapolate and say that if we were to do so, nearly all would respond to that. And every one of those incidents takes time and a cost to recover from, to restore data, to change passwords, to install new software, or uh, from the downtime while the systems are being reconfigured. 
So the problem is very, very large and results in tremendous losses in productivity and time. Now, the current research that is being done in the area of cybersecurity has been largely focused on either fixing these problems from the past or on very abstract research. Now, the very abstract research is good scientific research, but it doesn't necessarily lead us to uh, some of the solutions we need now. Primarily, this is a, an artifact of the way that um, research has been done in academia because we generally look for closed form numerical uh, solutions to things for publication. And uh, that's where a lot of the focus has been. The focus on the current problems is largely a function of where the funding comes from, government and business. They're interested in solving their problems now. They're not looking five years or ten years out in general. They want solutions now to all the various problems and concerns that we have that affect their operation today and tomorrow and that affect next quarter's profit and loss statement. So things like viruses and worms and distributed denial of service and spam uh, are all issues. Patch management, application, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention are all big issues. And if you look at these, the issues that are involved are largely addressing problems based on the current software base that was poorly designed and poorly implemented. And that's where the bulk of the money goes. Out of the billions of dollars being spent in the United States each year by companies and government, uh, we expect that only in the tens of millions, probably the 30 to 50 million dollar range, uh, covers all of the basic research being done in computer security, network security, and, and the like. That's, it's a drop in the bucket, almost nothing. If we're going to make progress, we need to look at long-term research issues. There are, the immediacy of the threat is driving out a lot of the research that's being done in the short term. Also, the lack of sufficient funding for the research has a tendency to focus attention on the near term. When you don't have a lot of money available to go around, the people wanting to do the research who need the money to support the research are going to be more conservative in the kinds of things that they propose are going to try to come up with results that more people can see application for rather than longer term payoff. And as a result, it's going to drive the pool of ideas to a nearer term. The people who are allocating the money are going to be held more responsible for making sure that money is well spent because it's in shorter supply. And therefore, they are not as willing to take risks on longer term radical ideas. And so again, they're going to focus more on the near term. This is a problem. This leads to an attitude that we are better off finding new ways to patch rather than innovating our way to systems that don't require patching. It also means that the policy necessary really lags the innovation that the new products that are being put out to take advantage of market are being put out with minimal attention being paid to the security because that's not where the focus is. It's more important to get the implementation out and be the first to market rather than being the one with the most secure product to market. We see this time and time again. Um, gain market share at the expense of doing it right. So the focus that we have on security when it is when there is focus is that it's episodic. And the progress is episodic. It isn't that we have a long-term sustained funding. It's that we fund after some kind of disaster. We go after specific problems rather than looking at the generic underlying uh, causes. It's also the case that a lot of the government funding has been and currently is directed towards issues of national defense and the problems go much deeper. Many of the security problems actually have very significant impact on each and every individual user. Currently uh, it is widely believed, hard to prove it, but it's widely believed based on samples, uh, based on testing, that anybody with a Windows system on a DSL or cable modem without a firewall in place has already had their system broken into and it has some form of distributed uh, intrusion client on it that the owner doesn't know about. The current distribution of Windows is such that if you go and buy a new version and you take a system and hook it up to a DSL or a cable modem, the amount of time it takes you to download all the patches to bring the security up to date is approximately six to ten times the average interval for your system to be discovered, broken into, and compromised by the automated software that's currently running on most of those systems. 
So we have a real problem there in the protection of our systems, and this is well beyond some of the issues of national defense. Cyber terrorism is probably not the biggest threat, for instance, but theft of financial information, fraud, distributed denial of service, and, and uh, uh, issues such as those are probably going to be much bigger problems for us in the near term. We also have a big problem in growing the talent pool. The number of people who really know about security is small, and we do not have uh, enough places where we're training the next generation. You're fortunate to have a group of faculty here who really care about the area, who know a lot about it, uh, and have a training and education program in place. There aren't many in the country that have those kinds of uh, environments. There are really under about two dozen that have any kind of programs in place. The national output of new PhDs in the field is less than 20 per year. And about half of those people uh, go into industry, go, back, go to, back to their home countries, which many of you may be doing. And so they aren't staying in one place to build up new centers. They're actually scattered out to make a difference, but not actually contribute uh, to a new, a new generation of people working in this area. So the idea behind the Grand Challenges approach is we want to inspire creative thinking. We want to get people like you with great ideas thinking about the long-term challenges instead of the short-term. Instead of doing the incremental, let's think about the revolutionary instead of the evolutionary. There are many important problems that are going to require many people working at to solve. They shouldn't be viewed as a single investigator or even a small group. We're all going to have to look at these as big problems that we each take parts of and only as a community are we really going to make progress. And we're going to have to do it over a long period of time. It's not going to be one or two small breakthroughs that are going to solve everything. If we're going to make those big advances, we have to have big visions. That was the goal of the conference, the Grand Challenges Conference. that was held uh, November 16th through the 19th. The CRA solicited participation from around the world. We had over 220 applications to attend the conference, and we ended up inviting 50 people to attend the conference from a variety of different backgrounds with a variety of different interests. Uh, I was one of the co-chairs of the conference, and uh, Professor Anton was one of the uh, attendees at the conference. But we brought people in from all around the world, some very junior, a couple people who uh, were in the process of uh, finishing up their PhD work and starting faculty positions, people in industry, government, some who had been retired. Uh, it was a very interesting mix. And we conducted the conference as a kind of workshop similar to Gordon conferences where people's comments were not for attribution specifically, but that the group as a whole would report out some results. We started off with a view of what the future computing environment would be like smaller, cheaper, embedded computing, where at some point in the future, not too far off, you will have on your person on a regular basis perhaps dozens of small computer systems. You're going to be connected all the time with those systems. Your household appliances, entertainment systems, maybe even your furniture will have small computers embedded in it operating over local area networks communicating in your home, in your automobile, in your workplace. So you're going to have pervasive computing, pervasive networking. And those networks will be connected to have global reach and connectivity and global participation, much more so than we have even now. More and more people, more and more entities are going to be connected to this network. And of course, as more people and more entities are connected, they're going to have more to communicate with each other. As more items become networked, as more tagging becomes available, we're going to have more data to share, larger databases to hold and accumulate. As that data becomes available, as more communications become available, we're also going to have more user-centric services. Rather than organizationally oriented, such as record keeping or payroll, we're going to have more services oriented towards you as the individual. Internet commerce is going to grow. Doesn't seem it's going to shrink, but more and more things you're going to be able to buy you're going to be able to shop online. More and more government services will be available over the network remotely. There will be on-demand services that currently you have to go somewhere and wait for. If you want to watch a movie, when you're ready to watch it, where you're ready to watch it, you'll be able to watch it. 
um, the time shifting available for those kinds of activities will be promoted by the data storage on the high bandwidth communication. Telecommuting will become more often, where you don't have to go to an office every day or a classroom, but you can actually participate remotely. And individualized entertainment of all sorts, where you will be able to program in what kinds of puzzles, articles, movies, music, things that you're interested in, and you'll have agents perhaps go out and fetch those or watch as they're released and provide them to you as a tailored experience. That technology is all coming. There are companies working on that now. They see markets for it. Well, undoubtedly, there are people who are willing to uh, create the markets for it. As that technology is deployed, we have two extreme possibilities. There are many futures, but we can consider sort of two ends of the extreme. One end of the extreme is a simple extrapolation from where we are now. We will have an overwhelming amount of unsolicited junk coming to our systems. Not simply email, but that tailored uh, entertainment environment I was telling you about, you'll have things inserted, advertisements inserted into the things that you want to watch and read. Uh, maybe advertisements popping up in your remote work session or your remote class. Uh, those kinds of things will be intruded on your systems without your control. ID theft will become rampant. It might be argued that it is now. Uh, identity theft is the fastest growing crime currently in the United States. Uh, and in the amount of time that I'm giving this talk here today, based on the statistics, at least two of you will have your identity stolen in some way and used without you knowing it. Uh, Nationwide, approximately every three seconds, someone is having their identity stolen in some manner or another and used against them. We're going to have frequent network outages as uh, new viruses, worms, and attacks uh, go against the infrastructure, cause some kind of damage. We're well, going to require frequent manual intervention to bring these systems back up to speed, to clean them out, to be able to reconfigure them, to be able to deal with filtering the bad information that comes in. That manual intervention will be by each one of you as you try to use your systems. And we're going to have a whole lot of unchecked abuses of the law uh, and of individual rights by people who are going to say, well, your system isn't configured not to let me do it, so I can do it. That's a future that we're really on track for right now, to reach. We'd like to see something different, which is the other side where there are no spammer viruses on the systems. You can use them without worry of malicious software. Where users control something about the privacy of their own information. Where communications are uninterrupted by malicious outages. Maybe you'll have hardware outages now and then, but they'll be rare, similar to telephone system outages. Basically hassle-free computing, where you don't have to be an expert to configure the security controls. And where regulation and law enforcement are balanced with individual uh, rights to privacy and freedom. The overarching vision for all of this, that we went into this workshop with, this, this conference, is we want intuitive, controllable computing that everyone can use. That it's reliable and predictable and does what you expect it to do when you want it to do it. That it supports a range of policies so you don't buy packaged software that's intended for everybody to use, and you have to use it the way the vendor packaged it. That it adapts to a changing environment as circumstances change, as, as you change uh, location or work, or as the people around you change with what they're doing. Your system adapts without you having to go in and do low-level configuration. That enables rather than constrains you. It allows you to do new things rather than preventing you from doing them. That it supports your personal privacy choices. If you want to publish your medical records to anyone who wants to read them, that's fine. If you'd rather that they don't find out what your middle name is, you should be able to do that as well. And that security is not an afterthought, but is built into the systems from the ground up. That's where we'd like to go. The vision of those of us who work in security, one person put it as an analogy that resonated with many of us, is that security is a lot like putting brakes in cars. Really, the underlying purpose of brakes is not to st simply stop the car. The whole reason you really have brakes in the car is to make it safer for you to drive fast. Without brakes, you have to drive very, very slowly, because if you came up to an obstacle 
or someone who is driving badly, or you had a mechanical breakdown, you'd be in serious trouble if you were driving fast without brakes. Brakes allow you to drive faster, and when one of those things occurs, you're able to react and to make it safer for yourself. Better information security, more trusted computing, are like brakes. They're not to keep you from doing things. They're to make it safer for you to do the things you want to do. Of course, it's difficult, and we recognize many of the difficulties. You have adversaries with a variety of backgrounds and motivations. You have some who are motivated by greed, some by uh, ideologic purposes that they want to take down governments or they're against technology, uh, that they want to promote a particular political or religious viewpoint. Uh, you have some who are simply doing it out of boredom. Some who don't even know that they're doing it because they're being tricked into it by others. So there's a whole lot of motives, and the backgrounds vary as well, from people who know nothing about computing, who simply download scripts and run them, to those who are exceedingly sophisticated in their backgrounds and are able to design new attack tools of, of uh, increasing complexity. We also see that the systems are getting more complex and are having greater value data on them. As more enterprises come online, collect greater amounts of data, they become more attractive targets. The cost of entry is going down. Your ability to buy a computer system and hook up to the network, the, the price of that is dropping all the time. It's simpler and simpler for anybody to get access and employ these tools. It, do, it no longer requires uh, either a hefty bank wall or a nation state necessarily to give the resources available. The result of all of that is that we're getting an increasing leverage from asymmetric threats. That is, very uh, low-powered, unsophisticated threats attack against very large and complex institutions. So with that, as background, let me tell you about the four challenges that we came up with. The first challenge, probably something many of you would like to see happen, and I would like to encourage you to think about how to make it happen, which is eliminate epidemic-style attacks. These are large-scale, multi-machine, waves of attacks, and we class spam as an epidemic style attack because of its scale. It's not targeted. It's just out in the population and everybody gets it. Virus and worms are epidemic style attacks. Distributed denial of service attacks are these kinds of attacks. Why is it a grand challenge as opposed to simply a challenge? Why is it a big challenge that's worthy of interest? Well, these epidemic style attacks can be very fast and very large. The slammer worm is an example of something that hit 90% of all susceptible hosts in less than 30 minutes worldwide. That's a rather substantial spread. Next generation may be even faster. These attacks actually exploit the parallelism and connectivity of the network itself. So as the network gets bigger and better connected, these kinds of threats will also get bigger and faster and worse. Therefore, it, is a, it really is a grand challenge in the sense of something that we're going to continue to face and is going to get bigger as time goes on. As I've already mentioned, the price of entry is low. Uh, the attack techniques are unpredictable, as are the sources, and the network very often lends anonymity to the authors of these things. That makes it difficult. And we have no really active global defense because the Internet as a whole doesn't have a central locus of control. It is not a single place. No single organization runs it. There is no central response. We have to find a way to make the systems protected against this without having to go through centralized locations. Why does it matter? Well, you certainly know some of the reasons. I've already mentioned some, uh, some of the dollar costs, but it affects our productivity. It affects our ability to respond to critical uh, needs. When systems are taken down from denial of service or overload, some of those systems are time critical and safety critical. Things like air traffic control, hospital systems, police and fire systems. All of those need to be protected. All of those are being more interconnected. We can't stop that trend. So we need to worry about protecting them. It's also the case there are new applications that people are reluctant to try because of the danger involved, like telemedicine. Being able to have an expert in some form of surgery 
help with a procedure half a world away for someone who desperately needs it, but they don't uh, aren't able to afford to have a doctor like that come to that location. This is an application that many people have talked about for years, but with the current networks, we cannot possibly undertake that. It's too dangerous because there's no guaranteed reliability of the systems. I mentioned trends, the number of viruses going up, the number of attacks going up, um, and, and those are steep curves. Uh, those are not gentle curves, uh, and they're just going to continue going. There's, there's no sign of let up in either. The barriers, I alluded to one, nobody owns everything. There are lots of different owners with lots of different policies, lots of different intents. There are many people who are pointing fingers at each other saying it's not their fault. So the software developers say it's not our fault that other people write malicious software. There are people who are writing demonstration viruses and posting them on the net saying it's not our fault if other people compile them and use them. There are people who are releasing viruses saying, well, it's not if they're running vendor access software. Um, system administrators, users, a lot of finger pointing, very little real action other than after the fact putting in antivirus. We don't have the data for Internet's uh, scale size, uh, scale and size uh, experiments or analysis. We don't have that collected, again, because of the lack of ownership. We don't have test beds. If we have somebody who's developed a new counter to a, a massive, wide-scale electronic worm program, where do we test it? We don't have any real live systems that act like the network as a whole. Some of the solutions may require legislative support. The CAN-SPAM Act that was just passed by the U.S. Congress is actually a step backwards in many ways uh, in this regard. That will be realized shortly. Uh, how many of you saw your spam go down drastically as a result of January 1st rolling around? Um, for many people, it's actually gone up. And there are many conflicting economic interests that are going to drive this issue to uh, see how this can be eliminated. It seems unlikely that any of the companies making money by selling antivirus software and hardware are likely to be interested in seeing an end to viruses and worms. So don't look for a lot of research coming out of those organizations uh, to make this happen either. How can we demonstrate success? Well, I think that's uh, at least partially obvious. But we'll definitely see it as success when all new systems of manufacturing have this kind of protection intrinsic to them. It's not an add-on. It is a standard feature of systems when they're shipped. As well as having some kind of mechanism for the existing systems that are already out there. But this shouldn't be an add-on. This should be an intrinsic part of every component on the network. I mentioned there are a lot of other things that may be enabled. One that I think is important has to do with the ability to actually prosecute the serious crimes being committed online. There is so much noise from viruses and uh, spam and that kind of activity that it's difficult to separate out those cases where something really serious is going on. It's a distraction of law enforcement. It overloads intrusion detection and auditing systems. And therefore, it's very difficult to actually selectively go after the real problems of theft of fraud, of exploitation. I mentioned $55 billion in worldwide damage this year. Think of all the things that could be done with that money. All the, di all the differences that could be made in healthcare, in nutrition, in medical research, in housing, all the other kinds of things that that money could be deployed to use. Whether it would be or not is another question. But certainly that's a lot of resources that's being spent simply dealing with acts of vandalism and crime. That would certainly increase the confidence in our infrastructure. Some areas where research could well be applied to help with this, self-repairing systems, systems that diagnose their own problems and respond, uh, adaptive content filtering. This is a, a lot of work here in AI, linguistics, and other areas for analyzing the content. Network traceback and forensics. One way to perhaps cut down on the load is to go after some of the individuals writing these and sending them out. Uh, bringing, stopping them may stop whole families of viruses uh, being written because w people generally don't write just one. They get involved in this and write lots of them. Protocol design changes. We're all very familiar with IP version 4 and what runs on it, but that may not be the best protocol to be supporting what we need to prevent these kinds of software problems from occurring. IP version 6 may not be either. 
And of course, these are interface and control so that people understand when they get email with a document attached, they shouldn't open it. I'll, I'll put in a personal plea here, by the way. Don't send Word documents as attachments. It gets people into the habit of clicking and opening documents that come in where they don't know what's in them. And certainly don't send executables. That's a really bad idea. Even if you know what's in it, what you're doing is you're helping train others to just go ahead and click on things that they get in their mail. It's a very bad idea. Challenge number two. How do we go about constructing the tools and the methods necessary to build large-scale systems that are going to have really important societal impact? Example, patient medical record databases. So that no matter where you are, if you're injured or sick, your medical information is available to the doctors at that location. Or remote voting systems, electronic voting systems. So that if you don't happen to be in your home district or, or location, uh, you can vote on important issues. Or law enforcement databases. That again, law enforcement personnel, wherever they may be, can pull up the right information and only the necessary information so that they can't go surfing for whatever information they're still looking for, but what they need to do the task at hand. Those are examples of important applications, and there are many more. Why is it a challenge? Because we're using more technology right now to support these things. We're doing it whether or not it's secure. We don't know how to build these systems with high confidence that will resist attacks, but they're being used nonetheless. And we don't know how to compose those systems as individual entities into networks of systems that form large, trustworthy collections of systems. I find it sad and ironic that we have many people saying the best way to secure uh, to, to build a secure application is replace your Windows machines with Linux machines. If that doesn't strike you as ironic as well, then you haven't been looking at the number of bugs that have been reported for both sets of platforms. It's not a solution. We're building on untrustworthy platforms, and that is not going to get us where we need to be in the end run. So we need to have an understanding of what trustworthy means and how to put them together appropriately. Um, I think I just said that. Here are some examples of why, why it's important. Um, right now, United States, studies have been done by the National Institutes of Health that indicate that only about 5 to 10 percent of doctors have their patient records online where other doctors can have access to them because they don't trust or don't know how to use the systems in a trustworthy fashion to make those records available. The result is we have huge numbers of medical tests and procedures that are performed needlessly by doctors because they don't know what's been done before. They don't know the history and condition of patients. It is estimated that if we had all of our medical record systems online available for doctors and emergency personnel around the country, we could save collectively $100 billion a year in unnecessary medical expenses. That's a staggering amount of money. Again, think of all the places that could be used if only we had even a fraction of that available to us because we no longer worried about mistrust of our computing systems. Another example is e-voting. Um, right now, many locales are going to voting using computer systems in one form or another because they're under pressure to for political reasons, in some cases for economic and uh, other reasons. And yet, they're adopting systems that are inherently untrustworthy, where votes can be lost, changed, or corrupted without any audit trail. So wherever you do your voting, if you do voting, uh, particularly in the United States, touch screen systems, for instance, there's no way to do a recount. Because all that's internal is, a, is an integer value. All you can do is a reread. You can't do a recount. You don't know if the software is reliable. Oh, and by the way, the majority of voting systems are built on top of Windows. I hope that gives you greater comfort uh, about the way your votes cast. A report that's been in the news the last couple days has to do with a surge system that was developed for military personnel and uh, consular personnel overseas uh, to cast their votes in a much simpler manner than the paper ballots that are currently used. 
And the report shows there are numerous ways where that system can be compromised or, or should not be trusted. And yet the government is going to go ahead and use it. Why? Because it's convenient and they've written it already. That seems like a very poor reason. We ought to have systems that give us more confidence in our, in our process rather than less. Barriers to overcome, well, there are a whole lot of different legal responsibilities, regulations, restrictions that we're going to need to somehow reconcile with each other. I realize that's a lot of our words all at once, but uh, we need to worry about how to make those things come into uh, compliance with our technological capabilities and vice versa. We have to worry about how are we going to build these systems and deploy them with acceptable cost. We can come close now, but it's way too expensive. The software development tools and techniques involved in building trustworthy systems are so expensive that we can't see them actually being used on any kind of widely applied system. Uh, the numbers I've seen indicate that the uh, software, the flight control software that's used on the space shuttle is considered to be some of the most well-designed, well-tested, safety-critical software in existence. And to date, it has cost on the order of $200,000 per line of code. We can't sustain that kind of model for general purpose computing, I don't think. Uh, we also have to worry about privacy. Because some people believe that the way to have better security is we keep more records about everything. We more strongly identify every individual interacting with a system. And this is a huge threat to privacy. How do we come up with that necessary balance to make the systems uh, trustworthy, but not only trustworthy for their intended function, but that we can trust that the information and our interaction with it is not going to result in an exposure of our privacy. And then there's, of course, the problem about the installed legacy base. How can we demonstrate success? By actually being able to deploy a system. It's part of the grand challenge. We set a metric to say, well, if we achieve it, how do we know? Well, if we can deploy a system that has these properties, then we've succeeded. And we set some numbers here for availability. And these may be uh, extremely narrow. Uh, we may really be trying to set a goal for ourselves that's too difficult. But this is not unreasonable for medical applications. A maximum downtime of less than two minutes per day and an average of less than five minutes per month downtime. That's going to take a lot of work. Areas of research to support this, where we're likely to see some uh, progress needed. Fault tolerance, fault tolerant computing is clearly an area. Data provenance, I don't know how many of you have run into this term, but it's critical for many systems to know where did the data items come from? How confident are we in the source of those data items? Are they still valid uh, after some length of time has passed? So if you imagine your personal information that may be entered in a database here at the university, for those of you who are students, after you've gone to work and you've been out for 10 years, if someone were to base decisions on your record here at the university, would those be good decisions? The provenance issue has, goes to that question. How old is the data? Where did it come from? How confident are we in its correctness? Identity management, who you are how you, uh, and how you identify yourself to the systems is important. Your actual name may not be important. It may be something else about you that is important. It may be your age that's important. That's an aspect of your identity. Maybe you can interact with the system using a pseudonym, and that's fine as long as whoever's on the other side knows something about you that meets their qualifications for giving you medical care, information, billing. Many people say this is one of the big losses with e-commerce because I can go into a store and buy something with cash and it's not traceable to me. I don't have to give my name and address to be able to buy it. And yet when I go online, I have to enter credit card number, I have to enter address, phone number, I have to give all kinds of other information to be able to buy the same item. We need to be able to do that, to do the semi-anonymous, if not completely anonymous, uh, purchase of goods and services online. Uh, trace back and forensics. When people abuse these systems, we need to be able to find them and 
uh, take appropriate action. Intrusion detection and prevention. A lot of attention being fo focused there, but it's still not good enough for particularly critical applications to be able to protect them. Software engineering methods. Uh, this is an area where we really need to do a lot of work. And we also need to apply a lot of the work that has been done. We know a lot more than what is being used now out in industry. I mentioned science of design in quotes here. Uh, sometime later this year, the National Science Foundation will be uh, releasing a solicitation uh, seeking research proposals in the science of design, which is not only software engineering, but more. And uh, for those of you who work in related areas, I'd encourage you to watch for that. And then last of all, there's the whole issue of secure databases, data items, uh, against combining items, making inference or alterations to data items. Um, even, even if someone isn't able to de destroy the database or access the whole database, they may be able to get in and change items, introduce false data, introduce misleading data, take data and be able to do data mining on it to come up with conclusions and information that we don't want them to have. Challenge number three. For these computing environments of the future that are highly dynamic and mobile, we want to give end users security they can understand and control. Right now, it is the case that if you take a, an average person and give them a computing system and ask them to download patches or install antivirus or, or enable a firewall, they have no idea what you're talking about. They have no idea how to do it. They can't tell if it's turned on or not. They don't know why they need it. And a whole set of other questions. That's not going to be acceptable in the future. We have to have it so that they can understand those security features or whatever is needed at that time and be able to control them according to their own needs and wishes. This is more and more of a problem as we become more connected and more of our personal information becomes available. As we become more connected on a, on a permanent basis with PDAs, cell phones, uh, portable computers, RFID tags in our clothing and uh, uh, computers embedded in our automobiles, GPS being located in our cell phones, PDAs and automobiles. So our location is available, our name is available, our credit information. All this information is now available always on through wireless connections and wired connections. That's information we want to control. We want to have some control over who has it, where it's going. At the same time, we want to be able to exploit the benefits of that connectivity. That's why people are going there. So that we can actually do some of the things that people are talking about. Uh, you've seen the ads on, on television perhaps for RFID tags at the grocery store where you just load up the cart and walk on out. You don't have to stop and, at the checkout. That can be very convenient. Unfortunately, there's also the case that once you're out with the RFID tags in all of the, the groceries, anybody else with a scanner nearby can tell everything that you bought. Oh, you're getting a lot of beer today, aren't you? Or pick any other item. Uh, why, is it, uh, why is it a challenge for our community? Because it's going to be a lot easier to address some of these questions now than later. Retrofitting these solutions may not be possible. Privacy in particular is something that once violated is effectively impossible to regain. Once information is out, bringing it back again is next to impossible. Once you've told a secret, it's no longer a secret. So it's better to try and solve these problems up front. It's also a case that right now these decisions are being made for us by the vendors, not by those of us who are the consumers. We have to accept what they build into their systems as privacy controls and security controls. So we should all get involved in this process. There are also a number of multicultural issues, international issues, people with different concepts of what privacy is, people with different concepts of what security is. We need to have systems that support those different views so that people, again, can express what policies are most appropriate for them in their environment. Um, why is it important? I've already mentioned these. Um, it's also the case that a lot of the computing, a lot of the issues that I'm talking about are social issues. They're not simply technical issues. We would not have computer crime and computer security difficulties if we had no computers. But we also would have no computer crime and no computer security incidents if there were no people. Therefore, we have at least two components that are critical, not only to the problem, but to the solution set. 
there are a lot of barriers here. We have to overcome traditional models that people are used to uh, for the provision of computing, software, of privacy, uh, and security models. The dynamism of the models is a big challenge. The rapidity of change. Uh, the heterogeneity of devices is a challenge. Many different vendors, many different devices, many different protocols and standards, and trying to reconcile those in meaningful ways may be simple. It's also difficult to make things usable the more complex you make the protection. That's one of the biggest challenges to overcome, is presenting the simple interface to the complex technology underneath. How can we demonstrate success? Well, if it works and if people want to use it without undue training. If you think of things like the telephone or the automobile, there's a lot of complexity in the technology. And yet, it's very easy to teach a young child, or, or an adult, if necessary, but usually adults pick it up early on. How do you use a telephone? Fairly straightforward. Lift the receiver, and press the buttons. Use an automobile, we know what the steering wheel is for, we know what the pedals are for. Uh, we've done something to standardize the interfaces and reduce them to a level that users can comprehend. Areas of research that are likely necessary to support this. User interface design, the whole HCI area, human computer interface, is major here, obviously. Uh, privacy definition and protection. What is privacy? How do you define it? Uh, this is an area several people here uh, at NC State are looking at. Very few people anywhere are looking at, unfortunately. But it's an important thing if we're going to if we're going to protect privacy, we better know what it is. Identity management. What is identity? How do you define it? How do you manage it? Uh, access control. Database security again. Self-healing systems again. And data provenance again. These are all areas that are going to be important. They're not the only ones, but they're certainly major. Challenge number four. Develop quantitative risk, uh, quantitative information systems risk management that is at least as good as the corresponding financial systems risk management. We don't understand the full nature of what causes information system risk. If you're going to put a system up, how do you say how likely it is to be damaged or attacked? How do you say what the expected value of loss is over a period of time? We have no way of knowing for sure. We don't understand emergent behavior of systems as we connect more of them together to say it is riskier to connect this to than it is not to. We don't have a way of saying this firewall is better than this firewall in the following environment. We don't have any formal quantitative way of doing that. We don't have a repeatable method of doing that. And it is further complicated by the fact that even the things that we are able to tell, we don't understand the emergent and, and uh, interacting behavior of failures in large network environments that may change the whole equation. Why is it important? Well, if you can't measure it, you can't manage and improve it. If you don't know that what you're doing makes something better, you don't know whether to do it. If you don't know how much better it makes it, you don't know whether it's worth the expense that you go to to make the change. You therefore can't really manage effectively. You need to have the measurement so that you aren't underprotecting or overspending. And of course, what you measure is what you get. So if you measure the wrong things, you'll be getting perhaps the right amount of the wrong thing. If we're going to make this work, those measures have to be consistent and repeatable and unbiased and unambiguous so that people who aren't deeply trained in the area will be able to understand and apply them. Again, they're in the marketplace. Uh, a quote here uh, that someone brought up from Lord Kelvin um, about when you, when you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is a meager and unsatisfactory kind. It may be the beginning of knowledge, but you have scarcely, in your thoughts, advanced to the stage of science. If we accept that, then those of us who we like to label ourselves as computer scientists, working in this field have not yet reached the point where we can really say that we're doing science because we can't measure the risk. We can't measure the safety. We can't measure the quality 
of the software systems that we put together. Why does it matter? CIOs and companies everywhere and government agencies can't answer these questions and they're important to the operation of their business. How much risk am I carrying? Am I better off now than I was last year? Am I spending the right amount of money? These are all questions that are important in carrying out a, an enterprise and in allocating your resources to protect yourself. And in fact, uh, we look at the uh, national risk levels that uh, Secretary Ridge puts out. Yes. What does it mean when it elevates to orange? Now, in our personal life, maybe that means you need to go out and stock up on duct tape. Um, I'm not sure that would help a whole lot either. But from a computer systems perspective, what does it mean to go to an orange alert? What do you change? Uh, we have no idea now. We have no idea what that means. We have no idea what other measures to take, what services to shut off to justify the management of the risk in a heightened risk environment. We need to have the science of quantitative risk management to be able to do that. Barriers to overcome, lots of them. Getting the models right, getting the right measures, getting the data, getting the companies and organizations to report the data and help us validate the models. In today's environment, it's very difficult because no one wants to be the first to disclose the data. In fact, history has shown that commercial organizations that disclose data get punished for it. About 10 years ago, Citibank had uh, a set of break-ins from some uh, people in Russia who were breaking in and uh, stealing money electronically. And they actually did the right thing. They went to law enforcement, they cooperated, they identified the individuals, they had warrants issued, and then they reported it in the press that this had happened, but they had caught the guys. They lost something like 20 to 30 percent of their commercial accounts in the space of the next three days. They were punished by the market. And, of course, what happens is we all know that that doesn't mean that all the other banks are safer. It simply means that all the people who had invested in it felt that they needed to move their money somewhere else as a means of covering their assets. I went the whole talk to work that in. Um, sorry. Okay. But to do this, we're going to have to find ways to share data reliably without exposing uh, to new risk simply by, by sharing that data. We have to come up with common terminology for risk, which is an area we haven't gotten to yet. Um, and there are a whole lot of other issues. There's also an I don't want to know mentality that uh, is particularly in place in government, that there are people in government positions who are responsible for managing the security of their systems. They don't want to know how bad it is. Because if they know how bad it is, that means they're now going to be held responsible for fixing it. It's a rather sad statement, but it's true. Uh, if it was known how badly their systems are being run and protected, people would be outraged and they would then be responsible for fixing it or answering why it was badly done. So they would rather not know how bad it actually is. How can we demonstrate success? Well, the nice thing about models like this that are valid and based on good quantitative data, we can predict things. We can make predictions about changes, about risk, about things that are going to happen. We can titrate picking how much we want to spend on protection against a certain amount of risk. Insurance companies can offer policies with appropriate risk shifting so that they don't lose money by covering the losses from various security incidents. We can gain more reward by spending the right amount on security and that we're going to be able to communicate with everybody necessary to carry out an implementation of the models. Areas of focus that this is going to include, certainly the whole area of risk assessment and management. Audit and forensics are going to be important to understand what actually happened, how it happened, and what the, what the uh, ripple through effect is. Again, software engineering comes into play to be able to build systems, probably components of systems so that we can understand the risk of the individual components and then use that to extrapolate to the larger scale. Human computer interface, because we have to understand the settings necessary to be able to uh, uh, collect the appropriate measurements. Architecture of systems may have to change. Uh, instead of having large monolithic systems, which is where we're headed, um, we, we may have to go to more componentized or um, appliance-based computing because we're better able to measure the risk for smaller systems. The figure, I believe, uh, that I've heard is that 
the number of faults in software goes up with the square of the number of lines of code. Uh, and this has been shown time and again. Windows 98 had 10 million lines of code. We, uh, Windows XP had 60 million lines of code. Longhorn, when it comes out in 2005, 2006, will have 100 million lines of code, possibly more. So we can expect approximately a quadrupling in the number of faults present in the code. Now, that's not going to lead us in a good direction for risk analysis if we continue to look at monolithic systems. And of course, simulation and analysis to be able to tell whether these models are appropriate. The future doesn't need to look like the past. And that's the message behind these grand challenges. We can potentially change the future. We set as a timeline for these 10 years. Can we do it in 10 years? No idea. In fact, we're not sure if some of these problems can ever be solved. But we believe they're worthwhile in addressing because even incremental advancement is going to benefit all of us. Many people complain about long-term research for new architectures, new venues, new designs as being infeasible because of the large base of legacy code and hardware. Well, I like to tell you that 10-year horizon, let's look backwards 10 years. If we look backwards 10 years to 1980, uh, 1994, Windows 95 hadn't been released yet. The World Wide Web Protocol had just been developed and the first three or four sites with commercial activity had just gone online. There was no commercial use of the network, effectively, 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we only had about 30,000 computer viruses. 10 years ago, Digital Equipment Corporation was the second biggest computing company in the world. Legacy, 10 years. 10 years in the future, where will we be? Really, we can be anywhere we want to be if we apply ourselves to it. That's the message behind the grand challenges. And part of it means being a scientist. Let's get away from some of the practical. Let's try some really radical ideas. Let's put them forward and see how they work. Because sometimes the radical ideas are the way to really help us make progress. Here are a couple of URLs in case you're interested. Computing Research Association uh, has a web page with a lot of resources that are available to you. The Grand Challenges Conference has a web page with um, several bits of information, including a version of this briefing, not as, de not as many uh, details. I'm, I'll make this available to Professor Anton to uh, circulate as necessary for any of you who want it. There are also some follow-ups to the previous Grand Challenges Conference that CRA did. Uh, we are currently working on a report from this one that we hope to have available sometime at the beginning of the second quarter of the year. And for those of you who are interested in knowing about Sirius, which I really didn't talk a lot about uh, other than the very first slide, uh, our website is there. And you can find out more about the security programs that we have in research and education. And with that, if there are questions, I'd be happy to try to respond to them. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, one thing you alluded to is that uh, much of the research being done in software engineering is applied. I, I think that extends beyond software engineering and security in general. And uh, uh, I, I guess the question is, what, given that much of the research being done isn't being applied, people aren't using semantic checkers to try and avoid buffer overflow errors or type safe programming languages, uh, what can we do to get the industry to actually use the research which is being done. And if we can't do that, then what do we do? That's an excellent question that to really give a detailed answer would take a long time. Um, I'm not sure whether whether or not the mics are pick that up, but the, the question about how do we get people to pick up the research that is being done is one that many of us have asked. Uh, repeatedly and is an ongoing research problem, maybe should be listed on all four challenges as technology transfer uh, to see where that goes. For instance, we know right now that using a better language than something derived from C 
whether it's C++ or Java or C Sharp, would solve many of the problems that are present. For instance, if we were to switch our software base over to Modula 3, as an example of one, uh, we would really automatically do away with many of the problems that are out there because the language doesn't allow those problems. I, I think it's actually sad to consider that if uh, Dennis Ritchie and um, Ken Thompson had written Unix in COBOL, our network would be safer now. Because COBOL didn't allow buffer overflows unless you really, really worked at it. Um, so some of the reasons why things get adopted are quirky. And it's not clear where the psychology is involved. Marketing there, therefore, is perhaps something that we need to include. Uh, I'm still mystified why Linux is more attractive than BSD. BSD is safer and more stable. But there you go. Um, so I don't have an answer for you. Uh, I, I actually think that's a component of the challenges that we're going to have to look into is, is how do we transfer the technology to where it's needed most. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, question again. Uh, quick question, sir. How much research is being done at looking into the aspects of, say, biomedical engineering or biological modeling, which is probably one of the largest, most integrated networks we have, uh, with respect to how the, how the body protects itself against viruses and spam and so on and so forth? I'm just wondering if there's any research in that area. There is research that's being done in, in um, uh, biologically inspired security methods, uh, everything from intrusion detection and virus uh, protection to anti-spam technology. The parallels look attractive on the surface. Some of them, as you delve down, don't quite work out so well. Um, one of the big concerns is the uh, computing equivalent of uh, lupus, uh, where the system gets turned against itself. Uh, we haven't gotten quite to that point yet, but uh, uh, it, it, it may be coming. Uh, one of the pioneers in this area, Stephanie Forrest at uh, New Mexico, has uh, published a number of papers. Several of her students have graduated and doing some very nice work, one of whom just recently started a, uh, a startup using a biologically inspired intrusion detection and firewall system, whose name I can't remember and I apologize. Okay. The student's name is uh, Stephen Hoffmeyer. Uh, there are also some recent reports of the DARPA workshop on biologically inspired defenses. So this is an area where people are working on it. But not many. Other questions? Yes, sir. Can you elaborate on your criticism of the CAN spam act? Elaborate on my criticism of CAN spam, certainly. Um, one of the problems with CAN spam is it takes away individual rights of action. So it has to be done basically through a uh, U.S. attorney. And so, therefore, anybody who's really aggrieved about the amount of spam they're getting can't do independent investigation and action. It uh, overrides state law, and a number of states had stricter laws governing uh, uh, what constituted spam and, and what action to take. So, for instance, California had a very innovative and very strong law that has been overridden by, by the Federal Act. Uh, the Federal Act um, allows certain kinds of unsolicited email that most of us would consider spam. It's a, it's a, if you ever had a business relationship uh, with a company, then they can send you email, and it's not considered in violation of the act. Uh, there are a number of other other uh, such issues. If you're uh, so inclined, um, there are some links off the USACM page on this and other policy type issues. If you go to www.acm.org, that's the Association for Computing Machinery, slash USACM, that's the home page, you'll find on the left hand side links to a number of things, including database legislation, e-voting, privacy issues, and the like. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, I realize it's Friday on a nice day. I appreciate all of you uh, sitting through this for as long as you have. Thank you very much. I hope to see you all again soon.